Oh, look out now. It's the Bourbon and Banner Podcast, the most honest podcast in all of bourbon. That's right, friends and neighbors. We got everything you need to drink curious right here. So sit back, grab a pour, and check your feelings at the door because we're here to lay it down for you as only bourbon and banner can. The recent wrath of winter storms that hit the Midwest only reconfirmed our dedication to America's native spirit as Pops was seen on the local news pulling a distribution truck with his teeth into a liquor store parking lot after it had lost its engine. There was bourbon on board, and he wasn't about to let the weather stop folks from getting their whiskey. That's right, folks. Not wind, nor sleet, nor snow, nor hail, nor bad bourbon shall keep us down. Here we go. Tell me, Bob, what the fuck is up with this weather, brother? Snowstorms, ice storms, 70 degrees. What? It In the last, like, 12 hours, it's gone from 26 to 56. Right. I'm walking out in the yard with the dogs, and this morning I'm trying to keep from sliding all over the place. This afternoon I've got a boat and a paddle that I'm going through. <laughs> so it's just, it's nuts. And then last week it was 70, and then by, like, 11 at night it was down to, like, 24. It was even more than that, like minus 12 or some, I don't know. We had to cancel shows and shit. I'm just, I'm tired of this freaking weather. Just give me cold weather, no ice, no snow, just leave it all wherever and just give me the cold. That's all I want is the cold. Give the fat people something. Give us some cold weather so we feel better. Come on. And plus then, I like to keep my bourbon at one temperature. Cool, right? Just keep it room, neutral, cool, about 68 degrees. I'll be set. I'll be set. Well, um, at least the ice is gone for now. I'm hitting the road in two days. Going to head out with uh, Mr. Coombs out to Townsend, Tennessee, to hang out with Mr. Jeff Arnett. And even though we're going to be Smoky Mountains, it's going to be like in the mid-60s during the day. It's going to be absolutely gorgeous. Getting in the mountains of Tennessee. That's right. I have to ask Jeff Arnett, is Tennessee whiskey bourbon? Ooh. <laughs> Well, you know, his Sorry, new co- I'm just starting up shit, yeah, folks. That's right. His new company is called Company Distilling Company. We're going to ask a question about that. that <laughs> Wait that. a minute. Say that again? His, <laughs> the company, the, see, it just fucks you up from the start. His new business's name is Company Distilling Company. Okay. Yeah, Jeff, we got to know about that. That's right. He's known for his whiskey making, not his branding. But we will ask him about that. But- if I uh, did my research correctly, which about a 25% chance that it's accurate, their first product that they're sourcing, I think, is is a bourbon. So doing something a little bit new. Well, I'll be interested to see all that because Jeff Arnett is responsible for laying down some of my favorite whiskey that I've had in recent memory, all that barrel-proof Jack Daniels stuff. He When did he leave Jack? Just, it's, uh, it's only been, what, two years? Four, three, Year four years, half. maybe? Yeah, not yeah. that even that long. Um, yeah, I just think about the pandemic, and you got to take two years <laughs> off of everything. So that's know. right. Well, yeah, that's right. That Coy Hill, um, that that would have been his stuff, man. So good, good stuff. Very, very interested to see what he's up to next and what they're building out there. So we're going to go ahead and do that. But all back to the weather. Luckily, it's going to be nice. Going to be nice here in St. Louis. Wherever you are tuning in for, we hope you're getting a break on the weather as well. So. As we get further into this new year, so, you know, we're recording this on the last day of February. Um, you guys will be listening to it in the early part of March here. We are excited to say the community on Slack continues to grow, and we are ready to open up wave number two of entries. So we will be sending an email uh, out to everybody on our mailing list to open up the invites. So if you haven't already applied to get in, Uh, You might want to go ahead and do that. The link will be in the podcast show notes again this week. So you can uh, try to get in there, but then we're going to open it up and we're going to cap it um, at a certain number. So get in soon. And if you've applied and you didn't get in, well, there's a reason. And the reason is either one, we missed it or two, there's something about you that was a little sketchy, right? Maybe too many crotch shots, you know, maybe too many crotch shots on your Instagram feed, Maybe the fact that, you know, you have a hundred bottles of bourbon on your feed that you've never opened. That's kind of anti to what we're all about. So if you haven't been let in, that could be it, or I could have just missed it. So don't, you know, submit again. That's cool. Uh, Clean up your feed, submit it. Um, We won't tell anybody. Um, The one thing we won't do is a drug test. So at least we got that going for us. Yeah, it's going to, we're going to turn into like the mellow moments club and 
where it <laughs> opens for three seconds at the beginning of every month, and everybody tries to cram themselves to get in. And right. you but you know, I'm thinking about we are going to give out a Christmas gift this year. Every, everyone gets a, a Maker's Mark uh, bottle scarf. And, and you'll still have a couple thousand left. Cold. Exactly, right? I'll still have a couple thousand left. That's for absolute sure. But the community is the place to be. And every uh, podcast, we like to highlight some conversations from the community. So, Bob, you want to you wanna kind of tip us off for this month's community uh, thread or this this episode's community thread of the month? Yeah, well, someone had shared an article uh, from CNN. On, and I, I probably slaughter this name, Indivu Jin, I-N-D-I-V-O-U. It's Jin. Who gave the fuck? Anyway, they've, they infuse the gin with elephant dung, quote unquote, to flavor the drink with the varied botanicals that make up the elephant's diet. Oh, yeah, because that's what something you're thirsting for, right? Mmm. Mmm. I, <laughs> I just read. Just reading that, I just can't get past it. So we had somebody say, well, if it comes from a male elephant, it's literally bullshit. <laughs> but Pops actually got the winner that day, and he says, well, if it's flavored with the botanicals from the elephant dung, why is it not called Dunga Gin? <laughs> I have Dunga my moment. Dunga Gin, <laughs> darling, Dunga Gin. Well, I, I have my clever moments every once in a while, but I mean, uh, the other thing that it, uh, reminded me about is that, uh, coffee, that high end coffee called Kopi Luwak, which the monkeys eat the coffee berries and, and, and poop them out and then they collect it and they make coffee after it. And it's like super no. expensive. Yeah. You can keep your fucking money for that shit. I don't know. <laughs> Jesus Christ. We're drinking shit now. Well, I guess we've been drinking shit for a while, depending on what you're pouring. But you know, well, you know, it has a you know, shit. we have a lot of lot of you know issues with our society at large these days. But the fact that now someone's literally going to drink a gin, a gin, just full stop there, made from elephant dung, is crazy. Um, but you know what? It's better than some of the other stuff we've seen out there. Well, maybe that's not. true. That's right. That's true. I'm I'm betting that there's a, a a a stadium full of people who will go for the Dunga Gin before they're going to go for uh, uh, Bib and Tucker. <laughs> well, they should have put more money into their bottle to get up to speed with uh, Bib and Tucker. There you go. Yeah. Or uh, you know, it's you know what it may may actually taste bo- better than a bottle of slapdick. I don't know. <laughs> well, that's. There's so many things you can say right there. I'm just not even going to – all the double entendre stuff is just kind of just flying through my head right now, Pops. It's terrible. Well, just leave it at that. Keep an eye out for Dunga Gin. I mean, uh, the official name of this wonderful new gin is, is – is, I can't even – Rick can't even keep a straight face right now. See? In Duvu or something. In, in Duvu. Okay, there you go. In Divu and Duvu. Yes, that's right. That's our community service of the month. So if you enjoy crazy-ass shit like that – you definitely need to be part of our Slack community. So follow the link in the podcast show notes and uh, submit it. Uh, but make sure to clean up that Instagram feed. Okay. Just we're, we're, we're looking. We actually read that stuff, believe it or not. Uh, at least 25% of us is literate. Um, speaking of literate individuals, uh, several weeks ago, we announced uh, that Steve Coombs came aboard as our new editor. So we finally have a grown up in charge of the content. So this is thrilling after 11 hard years of putting letters together. And Steve's already started to make an impact. If you haven't been reading some of the stuff he's put out, we've uh, brought in a bi-weekly feature called Head and Tales, where we feature um, whiskey news and opin- opinionated views. So basically, we'll highlight three to four things going on in the industry that we think are kind of interesting, and we'll comment briefly on what we think about it, right? So whether we're making fun of top 10, top 20 lists, to talking about peanut butter whiskey, which we will get into that sticky-ass situation later, or talking about uh, the things that Chuck Cowdery is pissed off about people being on his lawn. So if you like that kind of stuff, want to keep uh, updated with a little bit of a point of view, check that out. It comes out twice a week on the website. We're also going to be uh, increasing the number of reviews coming out, as well as some articles and whatnot. And there's a great one actually featured this past week about, is it time to ditch the term craft distillery? So if you haven't read that yet, 
head on over to the website, read that, let us know in the comments what you think about the term, what it means to you, um, and we might make that a point of conversation on a future podcast. It's more commentary from the most honest team in bourbon, I tell you what. Coombs is hitting out of the ballpark with that stuff, too. So for those of you who enjoy our uh, the no-bullshit brand that we have, this is definitely that. We give you the straight-up take on this stuff. So it is a joy to read. That's right. Won't take much of your day. And the other updates uh, are to do with our single-barrel club. So we had a little bit of a slow start at the beginning of this year because I – got knocked uh, down with COVID, but we were able to convince uh, one of our longtime senior contributors, Brent Joseph, to step up. He's now our Single Barrel Club director, and he's helping to pull some selections together. So we've got a couple things confirmed for this year. Uh, We've been given a Four Roses private selection pick, so we're super excited about that. Um, We are going to be going down to Wilderness Trail, Spirits of French Lick, and the most exciting news, um, no offense to Four Roses or anybody else, but the most exciting news for Bob and I is we got uh, noticed just a mere four days ago that we are going to be able to do a private barrel selection of Wyoming whiskey, and we are super, super stoked. That's right. So for those of you, the the the, uh, the weeded barrel proof bourbon is uh, is very hard to come by, you know, outside of a few things, and so we have uh, we have long been fans of Wyoming whiskey. And uh, a bottle of their private selection barrel strength wound up in my lap several years ago, thanks to uh, my brother. Uh, and we loved that. So we've been trying to get on board with that for a while now. So we're happy to announce that that one's going to be coming through this year. So we look forward to that. Absolutely. So once again, we'll drop a link in the show notes so you can go learn more about how you can become part of the Barrel Club. And if you do, um, you'll have access to all the picks that we uh, do this year, and there'll be many more. We're shooting for at least 10 um, to be selected this year, and with any luck, they'll all come in before the end of the year. Some may roll over next year, but that's okay because spread your cash out evenly, right? So hopefully you'll take uh, advantage of that and become part of that club. And uh, the other thing we're going to do this year is people, depending on what tier you join the Single Bear Club, you may get an opportunity to actually join us on a barrel pick as things are starting to open up a little bit. We'll have a little bit more room and we want to make sure we get the community involved as that well. So hopefully we'll see some of you guys uh, on the road this year. All right, folks, now that you're back from pausing and signing up for the single barrel club, it's time to get into the whiskey news. Super Bowl, Super Bowl, Super Bowl. I don't know if you saw this, Bob, watching the game, but uh, uh, AB introduced a new product called Bud Light Next. Now, Bud Light Next, believe it or not, they were able to squeeze more calories out it out of the whiskey. Uh, so they've lowered it to 80 calories, dropped it to 4% alcohol, assuming it's got less taste as a result. And it's now super light. Well, they did this big raw, it spent probably millions of dollars. Well, obviously, they bought a Super Bowl commercial, right? But all the brand buildings and all this stuff. But what they didn't do is somebody forgot to register the fucking domain, BudLightNext.com. So what happened? Apparently on the eve of the big game, right, a website went up and it was a spoof website that had some, what they said, random and sometimes creepy pictures and redirect prompts, as reported by Ad Age Magazine, such as, why did you look at that, you freak.com, and hopefully you're not on your work computer.com. Accordingly, uh, a who is search looking up the domain name revealed that there's a protection on it from a privacy uh, service, right? So you can't see registered, but similar attached URLs indicate that the owner was Miller Coors. And of course, Miller Coors and AB won't respond to this, but if Miller Coors was trolling Bud Light next and discovered that the domain wasn't registered, I just want to give them a standing ovation. Holy hell. That's fantastic. Amazing. That is, it's like they're the Wendy's of the beer world. You know, um, that, that I, I applaud that. First of all, Bud Light getting more flavor. How do you get something that has more flavor out of something that doesn't have any flavor to begin with? And, you know, to less alcohol, less calories, just just drink water. It's the same thing, except the water is probably, you know, uh, more flavorful than the Bud Light is. Yeah, but the water, um, you know, well, actually, I was going to say the water doesn't come in a cool can, but now you can get that uh, that brand of water. They did a Super Bowl commercial, too. What was the name of that? Like Liquid Death, and it's just canned water. I just, you know, 
When did we, there's an old George Carlin routine where he says, when did we become so thirsty as a nation? Everyone is walking around with their own personal supply of water. Some asshole, some walking around, he's got a jug of water on his hip. He says, don't you take a drink before you leave the house. And I'm like, you know something, there's something to be said for that. It's like in the last 20 years, everybody's going around with their own personal supply of fluids. I just... Oh, who fucking cares? Well, yeah, and back in our Just, day, right? You get thirsty, you got the damn hose. Let it run for a few seconds. You drank from the fucking hose. Yeah, that's get right. Get the hot water out, the get hose. the snakes out, get the dirt, the snakes out, and then you drink from the damn hose. And, uh, you know, you go, to, you go to the Home Depot now and you buy a hose, and it's like, not suitable for drinking from them. I'm like, yeah, fuck you, watch this. <laughs> I'm the evil Knievel of hose drinking. Well, the hoses used to be made from shit that wouldn't just, like, all completely come apart inside and be you're drinking all this horse shit because... Nothing is made the way it used to be, damn it. You know what? I'm going to kill. I'm going to die something. I guarantee it's not going to be drinking from a hose. That's for damn sure. No. Um, made in wherever. I don't care. But anyway, Bud Light, you knew, should have known better. And Miller Coors, I, I finding, you know, a, something nice and thin to drink, i uh, put you on my list. Somebody had to have gotten fired over that. How do you roll out a global brand? And don't register the web, the web domain. I'm just just saying that in in and of itself makes me laugh. Oh, absolutely! I just can't. You know, I I don't know. Yes. Well, there is oh, there geez. is there is a junior marketing, digital marketing gentleman or woman looking for a job. So, <laughs> or maybe you know, you say it, it's it's karma's a bitch. You it, remember that whole corn gate? Oh thing? yeah, absolutely. Yeah. When Bud Light did the whole. Uh, corn syrup thing uh-huh. so yeah well you know these yeah. these these beer companies for decades have done this kind of backstabbing shit um and there's some good stories and some books you can buy and whatnot about it so um this is a good next chapter so well done uh, i just wish more people could have seen it uh, i wish i could have seen it live i'll have to track down some screenshots and then put that out there so if there's any uh george remus fans out there this one might uh strike a nerve but chuck cowdery in his recent uh, quarterly print piece said that it's time that MGP should put the George Remus brand, quote unquote, back in the grave. And basically he's saying that they need to shut the brand down, come up with a new name for what they're otherwise good bourbon because of the history associated with George Remus. For those of you who don't know, George Remus was a famously successful bootlegger during Prohibition. He was a lawyer. He was a pharmacist. Um, and he is evidently the real world inspiration for the character great of featured in the great Gatsby, but there's a much darker side because obviously he was a bootlegger. He was a gangster. Um, and ultimately he wound up killing his wife because she colluded with the, uh, I don't know if it was the tax agent or the government agent who was working to put a case together. And while George Remus was in jail, they took all of his money. And then they were going to get married and George Remus showed up and killed her and apparently shoved the gun so far into her stomach um, that it came out the other side or something like that. Very nasty business. And this is starting to make the rounds in social media. So now we're facing a situation where is this going to get enough traction where people are going to call for the cancellation of the brand or is there an opportunity for MGP to get ahead and exit the brand category? Well, you would think that they would have uh, done that research before labeling something if it was because this eventually was going to pop up, you know, I mean, now I like I was telling pops, you know, earlier, I, I was not aware of the whole, all the, you know, the historical aspects of it. I mean, I knew it was a bootlegger, but I, I'm only knowing what I'm seeing and the stuff that comes over, you know, um, the bourbon is damn good, but it's, it's not even MGP anymore. It's what it's, uh, shits and giggles distillery or whatever the fuck is the name of the distillery uh, now? The Ross page. and Squib. Ross and Squib. So yeah, they're great at changing names. Change the fuck, just keep the fucking. <laughs> That's a good point. I don't. I don't give well, a shit. I mean, yeah. You know, here's what's interesting, Bob. Is several years ago, I went on a media junket and got to visit um, the MGP's facilities, and it was a great time. And we were tasting it because they were releasing version two, and they had actually tweaked the proof based on some feedback we had given them before. And Maggie Kimbrell, God bless her, was sitting there and she raised this question to them and said, you know, they're in a front of room of whiskey writers, right? And she said, how do you guys justify using this knowing his violent history, right? Just violence in general. 
And because they, the brand George Rumis was actually launched by some Cincinnati area businessmen to give a little more context. And they were buying MGP products and they are one of those groups that in my opinion really could fuck up good bourbon. MGP finally bought the brand because all the IP for George Remus was owned by this group of businessmen is my understanding. So they bought all the IP. There was nobody else owning it. So they had a free and clear brand license. You use everything, you know, much better than what Bud Light did recently in the previous story. And they relaunched it, reformulated and brought out a product, which was actually good. All right. So she raised this question of how guys, can you guys do this in good faith, knowing this history and the brand answer, as much as I liked the brand guys was, we're just choosing not to focus on that aspect of his character, which is fine. There are other brands that have got bootleggers who have bad reputations too, and people haven't caught on yet. So it's an interesting question of, can you keep that history quiet? I mean, look how long Jack Daniels didn't mention the nearest green story, right? Mm -hmm. So it's an interesting evolution. And as it's starting to build in social channels, it'll be real curious to see how this plays out because once again, if you don't know that part of it, you're, you're fine with him being a bootlegger. You know he was a criminal. You knew he was a gangster. But as this part comes through, it can be very interesting to see if they change the game and if they get ahead of it or if they do it in a reactive manner. So what, let's let's play some odds here. Do you think that they will take care of themselves or do you think they're going to wait until there's enough feedback to change the name? I could, after seeing what has happened since the, uh, since the merger, mm-hmm. I wouldn't be surprised if this stuff just goes all away and winds up into some different type of Luxco product. Okay. To all be right. honest with you. So you think they'll, they'll change uh, it that, before I it becomes mean, a problem? Seeing what they've done already, I, I can see Luxco putting it out as a, you know, just killing the brand altogether and uh, and rolling it out as something different under their name or a, an Ezra Brooks uh, specialty thing. Who knows? I okay. Know. All right. Well, we will wait and see. But, um, this is this is a fiery topic. I think this is really polarizing for some people. Of is you know the the woke movement getting too much or is it not enough? I mean, this, we've talked about this before in Bourbon, how the way p- women have been treated in the industry and in the advertising and the marketing. Um, so um, definitely let us know what you think. Drop us an email at podcast at bourbonbanter dot com. We like to see people's thoughts on this. And uh, does the history of a brand name or the people associated with the brand actually impact? your willingness to buy the product. Let us know. Um, Cause of course, if it does, then Bob and I are going to really get somebody to name a bourbon out of us. So you can buy the shit out of it. So, um, so some of the hottest news right now that's been bubbling up out of Kentucky is the questioning of whether or not single barrel programs are technically illegal. Steve wrote about this in heads and tails and talked about a podcast um, you know, that Mark Gillespie over at whiskey cast was one of the first guys to report on this learned that the private pick programs, which distilleries have been run for many years are currently outside of Kentucky's current tasting laws. So there are laws that limit how much sampling you can do. And if anybody's been on a barrel picky sample, a hell of a lot more than those rules allow. There's issues with who gets the revenue, who gets the tax, what jurisdiction it goes to. So basically somebody finally woke up and said, Hey, these are illegal. And this wasn't your run of the mill, like, oh, it's a problem, we need to fix it. This was a, holy shit, we need to get all hands on deck. So everybody's scrambling. There's a couple bills right now um, being reviewed, and if passed, we'll fully and properly define things and eventually make these programs legal, as well as some additional potential benefits for the industry at large. But this is one of those things that nothing changed to make them illegal. They've been potentially illegal for a long time, and someone just now decided to make an issue of it. This is what happens when politicians get involved in shit. See, so keep these fuckers. You, just, you can't. You can't even. There's, a, there's enough that these fuckers can't do right to begin with. Leave the damn whiskey alone. Haven't we learned that fucking already? How much tax revenue is going to get screwed over if something like this happens? With sixty million in sales. Sixty million in sales is the estimate. Estimated on a low end. Right. On a low end, sixty million. So just, just, you know try to pretend to do the fucking job and leave the fucking whiskey alone. Well, you know, politics have been fucking up whiskey since the 1776. And before that, quite frankly, if you read any history in whiskey, whether it's American history, whiskey or scotch or Ireland, everything's as soon as they start taxing everything, just messed everything up, you know, um, damn, uh, regressive taxes, you know, tax, the tax the vices, right? Um, 
So let's hope they get this figured out and whatever they put in place doesn't screw something else up down the line because we know these things get complicated um, because God knows uh, we don't want to miss out on our opportunities to do some barrel picks and we don't want people to lose money over this either, right? Because the things that raise money for the industry help us get new cool uh, future stuff. And uh, if we can reduce um, Buffalo Trace's uh, reliance on fireball sales to drive future bourbon innovations, I'm all for it. I would be, I second that, absolutely. So let's talk about a few of uh, the new releases that are coming out. A couple of these, um, we just posted some reviews recently. Um, The first one I want to talk about, which I was super jazzed about, was Green River Bourbon coming out of Owensboro, um, Kentucky. And this is being distilled by the people that unfortunately have the reputation of uh, being OZ Tyler uh, and their whole uh, proprietary process. But I am really, really happy to say that that's not what is going on here at the Green River Distilling Company. This is real legit bourbon. This is their debut product. It's 70% corn, 21% winter rye, 9% malted, 2 and 6 row barley. No age statement, um, but we know it's been aged more than five years. It's 90 proof, a uh, whopping thirty four ninety nine for a bottle. That's right, a debut, new release, under 40 bucks, and it's delicious. It's not super heavy and super complex like I like a lot of stuff, but, man, it is super tasty, and I've only had the bottle for about two weeks, and it's almost gone, and that's only like three or four sittings. Um, so I, I'm loving this stuff and I'm thrilled. Missouri is going to be one of the first market it's going to get come out in and I can't recommend it enough. Pops over there drinking the bourbon through a straw, ladies and gentlemen. That's why there's only that much of the bottle left. He's just got a big straw, not a fucking pipette, but a straw sticking in the bottle. That's what I just happening. glad somebody's listening to me and was like, keep those price points down people. Jesus, come on. Well, yeah. Speaking of price points, right. The, the next the, <laughs> the next item on your list is the yeah. uh because what do you think of when you think bourbon you think of St. Patrick's Day don't you <laughs> well this is this sure this is one of those things I wish I had gotten about it Steve Coombs got a sample of Kentucky Isle St. Patrick's limited edition bourbon green label everything you're like okay so it's like got to be whiskey finished in Irish barrels or something like that no it's bourbon blended in an Irish style I'm not sure what that means uh, other than an Irish guy was involved, and I, I'm not trying. I was going to say, does that mean there's a drunk guy eating, you know, potatoes and sausages while he's mixing this stuff together and blending this? You know, he's got a, a pint of Guinness. Listening to the commitments, the commitment soundtrack one and two. Um, <laughs> I don't know, but you know, Steve, Steve's like it's a really pleasant blended blended bourbon, right? It's really tasty. It's good. It's a hundred proof, um, and then he has to spoil it because the MSRP is 135 dollars, and a hundred bucks more than the bottle you were just talking about. Yeah, and, and Steve is like, no, not better like that. Not at all. It's good bourbon. Uh, I think he told me if it would get it under 50 bucks, he might be interested in it. He said, he said you go to Costco and get it for 95 but I, you know what? I'm just going to not going to do that. <laughs> There's something about buying bourbon and like super duper sized toilet paper in the same place. I don't know. Well, no, I don't have a problem with that. I'm just not going to buy a $95 a bottle of bourbon at Costco. Unless well, it yeah, says just, Pappy Van know, Winkle on it. <laughs> well. You know. I would suggest you take a second look at whatever it is that <laughs> yeah, says no Pappy joke, Van right? Winkle on it. When you put it in your cart, right right next to the 68 pack of cheesecake bites. I'm going to launch the Pappy Van Winkle starting starters kit, right? going to be a one-year-old uh, old elk weeded uh, bourbon, um, and uh, you age it at home. So anyway, so if you're a fan of Kentucky, I'll check it out. Uh, we've gotten people's feedback on it, mixed reviews. People are like, yeah, it's not bad. But most people are like, yeah, the 135 price point, yeah, yeah go walk off a short bridge. Um, it's, it's, a, it's a little steep uh, for what you're getting. But, hey, Kentucky, all they're known for that in terms of pricing, right? They released their first debut whiskey. was absolutely fantastic. And everything since then has been compared to that first one is not as good and overpriced. Hey man, they got to get the resource together to build that big ass fucking uh, uh, oh, what's the fucking thing? Where Pyramid fly up and down. And, no, the fucking roller coaster. That's oh, what they that's are. Right. You know, that roller coasters at Kentucky Owl Park or whatever, Stoli University, whatever the fuck they're building out there. Well, good luck. Um, and I've now made sure I will never be sent a bottle of Kentucky Owl products. Not that I've ever gotten any, but 
damn for sure. Um, all right. So uh, once again, file this wherever you need to file it. Woodford Reserve is going to release the 2022 Kentucky Derby bottle on March 1st. So by the time you listen to this, you may have missed it. But if you are aware of this, it's being released at the Turf Club at Churchill Downs. A lot of people, this is a big collector's item. I think there might even be some some NFT action going on this year uh, with some bottle releases. So if that's your thing, go for it. Um, I'm going to pass. Bob, I know that you're going to pass on this as well, as surprising as that may be to some of our listeners. Uh, but hopefully if you are someone that collects those derby bottles, um, I hopefully you get one to add to your collection. Um. But keeping uh, on the theme of Brown Foreman, um, word had just came out last week that they have released uh, Old Forester 1910 Extra Old Bourbon. Now, before I tell you what that is, I just want to point out, I was looking back at the Old Forester 1910 original website, and it was called the fourth and final release in the series. Until. Until. The fifth. Until the fifth release. Now, I know we're splitting hairs, and Bob and I, if you saw our head, we know we're not very skilled at splitting hairs. Um, this seems like something's going on. So how is this different from the other product? Because both of them are what's called a double barrel product, right? They age it, and then they put it in a secondary barrel, let it age a little further. So in reading the press releases and comparing it, the 1910 uh, Old Fine Bourbon, which was the first one, uh, was aged in a secondary barrel for a short period of time to change the flavor profile. This one, since the, they had the air quote extra old to the label, has been left to age 18 months in a secondary barrel, hence the name extra old. Um, so they call it, this release in the 117 series is a curious exploration into the intensity of the proprietary heavily charred 1910 barrel. This liquid was allowed to rest for 18 months in the secondary barrel, extracting significantly more of the heavily charred influence. Proprietary heavily charred. How heavily can you char a barrel, really? No, no. What's proprietary is the heavily charred influence. Uh huh. So now barrels are influencers. But anyway, um, it's a limited <laughs> expression. Okay. So get yours. It's 93 proof. So all you newbies, this is perfect for you. Um, you know, start collecting. Uh, and you know what? It's only $49.99. Um, now, I'm not a fan of the 1910. It's not bad. It's not bad. The 1920s where it's at in that series of whiskeys. I mean, anybody who's listening to this podcast knows 1920s where it's at. But the question is, when I see something like this, and they're like, now it's been aged even longer, I'm kind of like, did you have a glut of it? Did it not sell? How did this come about? Maybe maybe they took the 1897 and put it into barrels longer to make it the 1910. I don't know. I call this or whatever the other the, whatever the other ones are that that they can't. It's like sell. taking a page out of the Yellowstone TV show playbook. If Yellowstone, you have 1893, you got 1932, 1973, 1968. You're just going to create new ones over and over. You're just going to move around until somebody the combination of the number and clicks and people buy it. Yeah, but that 1883 show's not bad. I'm enjoying that. Did you see the the, the finale? No. And then I'm not going to spoil oh, it. Oh, wait, was that? It came was, out yesterday. Yeah, don't. came out yesterday. Did it come out yesterday? Yeah. I don't think I watched No, I didn't watch it yesterday. Okay, I won't, no, I, 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 I won't so. ruin it for you then. No, don't ruin it for me. By the time it. this airs on the website, you will have watched it. Yes, I will have okay. seen it. All right. No, good show. Enjoy it. Very much so. So I'm not making fun of that, those guys. But this one's a little weird. But you know what? It is what it is. Um, Jackie does a good job with this product line. It's just not for my flavor profile. But it's a little odd that the fourth and final is now the fifth, and, well, there's no mention of final anymore. So we'll see where this series keeps going. For me, though, um, you know, uh, 1920 is where it's at. That's for sure. Coming next, 1921. That's right. Uh, Hey, if you've got an opinion on this and which one of that series is your favorite drop us a note at podcast at bourbonbanter.com and we will read it and act accordingly so as we finish out whiskey releases we're going to switch gears a little bit because we're heading into saint patrick's day the most american holiday uh in all of europe 
Um, and we are announcing that the Glenda Low, and I'm going to print, I'm, I don't know how it's pronounced, Glenda Low, Glenda Law Distillery is releasing a single malt whiskey, Irish whiskey finished in rare Musinara cask. So that's, you know, Mongolian oak, Japanese oak, whatever you want to call it. It's a seven year old Irish single malt. Um, and it's aged in those casks, which is sourced from the island of Hokkaido, Japan. I lived in Sapporo for a year, so I'm very familiar with Hokkaido. It's very much like the Midwest. And it's the first Irish whiskey brand reported to use that type of wood. Um, so I'm really, really hoping I'm going to get a sample sent to me because I want to check this out um, to see what it tastes like. Because I do like Irish whiskey. Um, and the more unique it is, the more I tend to like it. Um, so if you are an Irish whiskey fan, you might want to keep an eye out for this. Um, it's going to be uh, start available well today. We're recording this on the 28th of February, so it's releasing today. And it's going to be... A, out there for a suggested retail price of $99.99. Once again, a lot for a bottle of whiskey, Irish whiskey, um, but it is pretty unique. So if you've got the budget and you're not going to be taking away, you know, your fast food budget or whatever, um, you might want to check it out. You're telling me that the island of Hokkaido, Japan, is very much like the Midwest? Absolutely. Are you, like, surrounded by Steak and Shake and White Castle and... <laughs> You know, uh, Waffle House everywhere you go. Uh, I was speaking of the climate. <laughs> uh, it's like okay. the middle of the country. So you're saying that. I'm like, I do not see some guy down on the corner panhandling for money when you come to a stoplight, uh, you know, with a, you know, whatever sign there might be. No, they have a and, they uh, have a huge so. dairy industry. They're known for their ice cream and their butter up in Hokkaido. And the city of Sapporo, which is where the 72 Winter Olympics were held, was the first modern grid-like system uh, laid out in the city. So if you go to Tokyo or Osaka, the cities are winding streets. All these curves get lost easily. Uh, but up in Hokkaido, everything's laid out on a Western uh, grid-like style for city. Um, so with blocks and avenues and things like that. So the takeaway I'm hearing here is they've got ice cream. Well played, sir. Well played. Thank you very much. Well, folks, that's all the news we're going to tell you about. And if you have any ideas for next week, drop us a note. As always, we'd love to hear from you. And with that said, we are going to dive into our special feature this week. This one, I know you guys are used to a really over-the-top parody news item, but this is actually something that um, we are super excited to learn about. And coming off the heels of the wonderful um, charity work done by some organizations raising money for the tornado survivors in Kentucky. It is really, really great to see them, you know, once again, coming to the forefront to bring something that is going to benefit a unique cause and really make um, whiskey geeks really, really excited. So I teed it up for you, Bob. Bring this home. This is really big news for people, and hopefully they're going to get excited about it. Well, this is a once in a, this really is a once in a lifetime release. Um, the Bourbon Crusaders are partnering with the Society for Transparency in American Whiskey, it's a straw as it's better known, um, for a release that can only be described as a bourbon nerd's dream. So check this out. Fred No, Jimmy Russell, Jim Rutledge, and Chris Morris got together and hand-selected barrels from each of their respective distilleries. So you've got Beam, Wild Turkey, Woodford Reserve, and Rutledge's private stock of creamy Kentucky barrels. They pick those barrels and are mingling them together to what is being touted as the Four Horsemen's Kentucky Straight Bourbon Whiskey. So I can't wait to see the visuals oh, it's on this. Fantastic. Um, we're still nailing down details from our sources, but here's what we know so far. So eight total barrels are being used, two from each distillery. The exact Proof is to be determined, but it's expected to be north of 120 proof. Um, all four master distillers were involved in picking these barrels from all four distilleries. So it wasn't just Fred taking the bean barrels, bringing them to Chris with the Woodford barrels. So they're all, they were all four involved in, in tasting and selecting them from everybody, um, which I find particularly interesting because we know about Rutledge, you know, Rutledge's iconic reputation for blending. Um, and rumor has it that he took the lead on the percentages used and went through more than 40 different variations before bringing a final four to the group to decide on what they would put in a bottle. So Rutledge has been, has been 
even more heavily involved in this, I think, than some others. But um, so the barrels that they are using for this include are a 14 year old Knob Creek single barrel, a nine year old Basil Hayden single barrel. Now, to huh. me, that that's the first the first ever to be featured in a public release. No oh, shit. Wow. Uh, Coombs was telling us about that. He tasted a barrel strength Basil Hayden thing uh, a, a while ago. Uh, and he said it was one of the best things he ever had. So um, I don't. I we have reached out to try to find out a little bit more from Beam if they're if they're going to start rolling out Basil Hayden private barrels or not. But they've got one in this release. So there's a ten and a twelve year old Russell's Reserve single barrel, two nine year old Woodford barrels, and then a twelve and a thirteen year old Creamy Kentucky barrel, um, which is sourced from Barton that Rutledge had sourced from there. So. Um, the bottle count is expected to be close to 1,400 full 750 milliliter bottles, but they're going to take 25% of that allocation, about 350 of those bottles, and split them into 375s to allow more fans to have access to it. Because obviously this is going to be an incredibly rare, rare thing, right. and it's likely never done again. Um, MSRP on this is going to be $5,000 <laughs> per bottle, which is going to come in a deluxe box that will feature a 50 milliliter sample from each of the eight barrels used to create this release. Well, that's different. So, yeah, you're going to have not only the main bottle, but you'll be able to taste the components of it. I think that Beam might have done that a while back with some press stuff uh, when they were doing one of the little book things. Um, so to in terms of rolling it out, each distillery is going to have a small allocation for sale on site through exclusive events this fall with the remainder being sold online through a dedicated retail sites being set up for this release only. Um, I was it's in a surprise move too. Sealbox will not be the online retail partner. <laughs> I was just going to ask you that because they seem everything runs in, but they're not they're not the partner. Okay. No, no, this is not Blake. So we haven't gotten the name of the of the uh, lucky retailer yet to process the online orders. We do know they are rumored to be the first online retailer, though legally allowed to ship to all fifty states via a proprietary licensing process. Oh, f- so everybody's wow. going to be able to get to buy this. Holy shit. That's um, unreal. If you if you can get it, I don't know how they're going to, you know, select you who gets to purchase. Can follow mules you know? and elephants and they're dung or something. Yeah. I don't know. I don't know. So now before everybody starts bitching about the absorbent price, keep in mind that the this is not the four horsemen of bourbon cashing in on the exploding whiskey market. This is actually being done to raise money and funds to build a physical home for the Whiskey Tasting Notes Hall of Fame. This is a facility that is going to be focused on pulling the curtain back on the whiskey industry, creating a more informed drinker, and providing historical accuracy of American whiskey and how it's changed over centuries, and using some of those legendary tasting notes. You've seen some of the things that Bourbon and Banner has put out, you know, in terms there are some things that just, that just really speak to it. This is going to finally come to fruition. Now, Straw has been in negotiations to procure a piece of land um, that is owned by a noted purveyor of Bourbon Truth, the one and only Lloyd Christmas. Um, So they're looking to buy some of Lloyd's land to put the Hall of Fame on. Um, Located in Truth or Consequences, Kentucky, which is a very small stretch off State Highway 60, um, Shelbyville Road between Louisville and Lexington. The location apparently consists of 30 acres of undeveloped land, and in the negotiations, Straw has also asked Christmas to curate some of the content for the museum once it comes out, uh, which he's agreed to do so as long as it can be done from his lair and not on site. <laughs> you know, for those of you aware, you know, kind of like the great and powerful Oz, Lloyd Christmas prefers to keep his identity a secret from everyone. Um, but the tens of thousands of people who are obsessed with bourbon and have already figured it out. So, (laughs) you know, there you go with that. Um, When we reached uh, the mayor of Truth, the Consequences for Comment, Miss Mabel B. Sheet said that the 37 residents of Truth, the Consequences look forward to working with Straw and Mr. Christmas to shine a light on truth and whiskey and some of the greatest tasting notes of all time. So this is, I couldn't, I I still can't believe it. The, The four horsemen of bourbon. I don't know if they got the licensing from Ric Flair to use that or how they're going to do it or if there's going to well, be a, the, a court Hopefully somebody's there. getting the, got, got the domain <laughs> reserved. Yeah, right. Exactly. Four Horsemen of Bourbon. We Maybe we need to go look that up right now. <laughs> well, I mean, you know, there's been some master sellers getting together before doing some stuff, but I don't think there's been a multi-barrel blend. 
Um, Never. At all. Never from never from multiple. I mean, you've got the little book stuff that Freddie's been doing, taking you know multiple different whiskeys on site there, but never across distilleries. Right. No, I not to, not to my knowledge. No, well, and the fact, I mean, once again, that that price, I, I'm never going to see a bottle. Um, but if they're looking to raise money for something that's really going to kind of bring a new level of clarity and cut through the crap, um, then I, I hope people pound pony up. I mean. The Crusaders working to raise money for the tornado relief shows just how much people are willing to invest in a good cause. So hopefully we'll see that play out here as well. I mean, that'd be fantastic. Yeah, you're figuring 1,400 bottles, you know, at five. Th- I mean, that's, you know, around 700 grand. Um, I don't know. And, and that's all estimated numbers. You mm-hmm. know, we don't know yet. I um, I don't know. I don't know. That, I mean, I'm not gonna, certainly going to be able to taste this. I know, Pops, you aren't. I don't know. Maybe we'll have to ask Atlas if we can try some. Well, I just want to update your number. 1,400 barrels at $5,000. It's actually $7 million, my friend. See? See? My computer got sticky. $7 million. So. <laughs> I don't want to hear about your computer uh, getting sticky. Holy cow. Back to Cream of Kentucky. Next on Bourbon Truth. Oh, my God. And that's, just, folks, why we don't do this 100% live. Ah, damn it. Sorry about that. Spilled shit all over the fucking computer. Uh, little spilt bourbon there. Well, Never hurt anybody, folks. Anyway. Losing, losing control there. And when speaking of losing control, I think it's time we head to the craft shoot. All right, folks. Welcome back to the craft shoot. This is where we take a craft whiskey that has been sent to us. And it has been put in a bottle and blinded by my lovely wife, meaning that neither Bob or I actually know what we're tasting until we unveil what it is by opening up the envelope. So with that said, we're going to go ahead and tuck into this week's sample, which we have labeled sample number 12. Bob, let's go ahead and give it a nose and tell me what you think of this great whiskey. No, no, no. God damn it. What the fuck is this? (laughs) Oh, Jesus Christ, Pops. This is like if somebody, you know, when you're a kid in like preschool and you've got those, the, the glue sticks and shit like that, that you're putting together the paper mache turkeys for Thanksgiving or whatever the fuck, and a bunch of the glues on a, on a, uh, something to paste it all over. That's what this shit smells like. This is fucking God awful. Jesus Christ. This has got to be an Elmer's distillery. <laughs> Wow, folks, oh, I really don't know man. what to do do the other to get. Not, mm, I'm at a loss there. Uh, let me go ahead and give it a smell um, and see where, I, where I'm going to rest on this one. Whew. That's a. Uh, oh, that's bad. Oh, that's that's not very inviting. Um, I don't get as much Elmer's glue as Fear and Loathing. Um. This is nothing you should want to be smelling, folks. Let me put it to you that way. Um, that is some young, some young ethanol. Uh, oh, I can't get I can't get past this fucking. It's you know what glue stick shit. It smells like just like a single grain with a bunch of rubber tubing and ethanol. Um, yeah, that's gonna yeah. pop back and snap you in the face, or you know. It's like you're in a tire shop. Uh, uh, you know, I think there's some licorice in there. Black licorice. It's been run over if there is. <laughs> like black we licorice. Have to taste this pop. Like black licorice you find in the back of the 1954, you know, Pontiac. It's been baked in the sun for 50 years. Uh, do I have to taste this? Yes, you do. <sighs> oh. I'd rather drink some slapdick. You know something? It's not as bad on the palate as it is on the nose. For oh, me. I think it's worse. To say that. Oh, it's not good, but it's, oh, geez. Okay, I'm done. I am I mean, that's not a bar bottle or bust. That's a busted. That's a burn. That's, uh, yeah, that's, um, oh, that's all. I, I'm trying, I don't even know that I can say anything that's not just insulting about this. That is young, just bitter. Got a lot of nuttiness in actually, it, but not in a flavorful nuttiness. It looks nutties. darker. You know, it tastes like stale peanuts. It looks darker 
in the glass, and I so I expected it to have a little bit more something there, but oh wow! All right, let's let's find out what this. Ooh, what is this atrocity? And is it from Texas? <laughs> All right, this is Scotty's Original Spring Straight Bourbon Whiskey, distilled from grain. Original. Sp- it's original Spring. It says Scotty Springs Original Straight Bourbon Whiskey. This is Scotty Springs. This is, this is one of those springs that somebody's been out behind the house pissing in the spring. This, That's what's this going is, on here. I can't tell by the 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 numbering on this if it's cask one or cask two. Um, I would I would guess it's number two. <laughs> Sometimes the material just writes itself. I'm so sorry, Scotty. Um, let me look this up. This is, oh, it's, thank God, it's aged at least two years. Really? Well, it's a straight bourbon, so it has to be, right? Um, well, yeah, but since when do they pay attention to rules? Well, that's true. So this is handcrafted in El Segundo, California. Oh, you're, <laughs> okay, stop this. Hey, look, it, it well, even calls out that it's got a, nu- a nutty flavor. So I'm like, man, I'm good, aren't I? I'm going to tell you right now, El Segundo, I immediately think of one person when I think of El Segundo. You know who that is? Fred G. Sanford. And the G is for go put that shit back in the bottle. Because Fred was always talking about, you know, taking a detour through El Segundo. Segundo. There you go. So they use purple barley. Um, Ugh. I've never heard anyone use purple barley. They're could be a reason i don't know um now let's see here are they actually making themselves here let me look at this so no this is actually distilled by a company called r6 and what's interesting is arsenic <laughs> that explains a hell of a lot arson r6 six, as in the number six. Oh, i see and i have some samples around here that I received from them a little while ago. I haven't opened theirs up and I just hope it's better than this. Um, we'll have to come back and throw those into the craft shoot maybe and blind them up a little bit. But, um, according to their website, Oh shit, there's a St. Louis connection, dude. Oh, you're apparently in, keep this in 1935, Petey, Pete Scotty opened a liquor store in downtown St. Louis. And, where his love of whiskey and bourbon quickly developed into a desire to produce his own handcrafted bourbon. So they got some old uh, newspaper ads and stories, and he would, uh, this was down at 812 Pine, Bob. We're in St. Louis, so this is why this is in. Oh, yeah, into that's down by the uh, the Majestic Hotel. There. He sold yeah, right eight-year-old 90-proof Kentucky straight bourbon for $4.17 for a fifth. And I bet you that stuff was good. Um, and then there was a little bit of a article about him and it said, businessmen go for a bargain. It says Pete, Pete Scotty, who had a combination liquor store and tavern at the corner of seventh and pine believes that fast nickels are better than slow dimes. Consequently, instead of charging 60 cents for three quarter of an ounce drink of bonded whiskey, he gives his downtown St. Louis customers seven eighth of an ounce for 35 cents. The result is that businessmen usually are standing six deep in front of his popular bar. Now, that's the way you do uh, this it. This ain't that. This, this ain't, that, ain't that. No. Um, this is unfortunate that they're doing this um, to Scotty's reputation. Um, wow. Well, I appreciate people who send me samples. I really do. Um, this is pretty bad. This is this this needs some age. I mean. You know, something tells me that even our friends at Art Eatables with their chocolates could not make this one work. You know, now we're going to have to do like a worst of the craft shoot segment, Pops. You have to put this in there against uh, that uh, Garrison Brothers smack you in the face uh, metal bourbon. Yeah, we didn't have any of that left, though. Thankfully. Yeah, I don't. Well, folks, um, yeah, don't waste your money on this one. I'm not even sure what it retails for. Let me see if I can find a price just to I don't know. Scare the shit out of you. Forty dollars. Oh. So it's more expensive than the Green River that you've got sitting there for thirty five dollars. Yeah. And that's discounted from forty two ninety nine, which is MSRP. Uh huh. 
All right, folks, this is a, this is a big pass. Um, you know, the green river got my first ever buy multiple bottles rating. Uh, and this is adding a new B, um, to set a bottle, uh, bottle bar or bust. This is a burn rating. Um, because, yeah, engine degreaser. Sorry, guys. I hate to speak back, but this stuff is not ready for prime time. Um, so come back next week, next month, and see who we put through the craft shoot. And our, our lineup may dry up after that. That just caught me off guard. So, well, with that said, um, let's talk. To, uh, we're going to shift gears here a little bit, move into some bullshit and kind of pick the morale up a little bit better on here. You ready for let's some bullshit? Hope. All right. Yeah, I, I'm ready for something. I got a, I got a, I got a, a four, 20 by 40 sheet of plastic, so let her rip. All right, folks, welcome to Bourbon Bullshit. You've made it this far. Why not stay for a little bit longer? We're glad you're here. We'll make it worth your time. What do you say, Bob? I think we're ready. We're especially after that last shit. Oh, we we need something. Yeah, well, something you know what? To lighten up the spirits. Would you? W- was that bad enough for you to be willing to drink peanut butter whiskey? There's nothing bad enough for me to just because you know it's like choosing between two different bowls of shit. The only difference is the smell. You don't want to check out the texture. No, no. <laughs> no. All right. Well, Fucking no. Let's talk about something uh, Mr. Coombs put in the heads and tails. He, he called it everything you need to know about peanut butter whiskey. Now, you know, he says himself, that's not a headline of an article that he really expected to ever click on, but he found it on tastingtable.com and he clicked on it, which is exactly what they wanted him to do. And after that, well, let's just say it went downhill fast. But according to this, the most famous brand of peanut butter whiskey out there, I'm sure a lot of people know, is called Screwball, right? But they are reporting they grew a whopping almost 2,000% in just two years. Now, there's no before and after numbers, but I'm sure it's been gr- explosive. I mean, <laughs> no pun intended. Um, but a fireball can sell. Why not peanut butter whiskey, right? So um, there's actually, you know, Somebody's asked the question, like, is there real peanut butter in peanut butter whiskey? And there's some brands that have that, peanuts or peanut oil and other ingredients, and then some don't. Um, But the question becomes is, what does it taste like, right? Bob, have you ever tried peanut butter whiskey? No. Well, what I can tell you is it tastes exactly like peanut butter with an alcohol edge. It I'm, I'm sure you won't be surprised. It doesn't taste anything like whiskey, um, but it surprisingly tastes like you're drinking like a peanut butter cup. Um, and if that's what you're looking for, it works great. I think uh, probably the um, only legitimate use where you won't entirely lose your man card or your women card or your whiskey card, that's just called a whiskey card, um, is maybe if you put a little bit of it into a bourbon chocolate milkshake for an extra flavor um or you could just use peanut butter (laughs) yeah i'm not one to do any of that shit i'm not putting the bourbon in the milkshake either and i know you 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 do that but i will take the shot of bourbon and a bag of reese's pieces (laughs) easter eggs and there we go if i want peanut butter whiskey i'm gonna have peanut butter then i'm gonna have whiskey i don't need to be drinking fucking peanut butter whiskey 70 proof kiss my ass (laughs) Just, just give me the fucking jar of Skippy, Skippy creamy peanut butter, and uh, a bottle of uh, you know whatever to cut that seventeen ninety two foolproof. I got it right here, the bourbon and banner pick. That works. Have a little of that there, and uh, you know fuck this peanut butter whiskey. Well, unfortunately, plus the, that whole screwball fucking ad campaign years ago, get screwed or some shit right. like that with the with the big black van with the shag carpeting that looked like there was somebody hiding, waiting for unsuspecting people to be walking by. It's, it's, it was a creep show if creepy, I ever creepy fucking shit. saw one. Well, unfortunately, people aren't like you, Bob, because this is one of the top-selling whiskeys in the country. Um, so say what you will once again about our societal issues, but I think some of it can be blamed on peanut butter whiskey. Well... You know, just because shit's popular doesn't necessarily mean it's good. No, that's not, right? There's The Grammys continue to prove that every year. <laughs> nice. Well, the other thing, and the really, 
I think this is bullshit all the way around. And once again, if you enjoy this stuff, that's great. Just don't tell me. We'll stay friends. Um, but is the fact that it says whiskey on the label, right? But legally, you have to be 80 proof to claim whiskey. And uh, most peanut butter whiskeys are just like that, like 70 proof. And the author of this article defended it says, despite the fact that some may say it's ABV doesn't make it authentic enough, peanut butter whiskey makes no claims of being scotch whiskey and isn't even produced in the EU. Well, what does that say? Well, it says that the person who's writing the article doesn't know what the fuck they're talking about. And that is the true bullshit of this is if you're going to write about whiskey, know what you're writing about. I'm not going to write about hairstyling because, well, I have no fucking hair. I'm not going to write about slim fit jeans, right? Because I'm not a sadomasochist. So don't write about whiskey <laughs> if you don't know the rules of whiskey. And that is the bullshit. You don't bullshit. just get to say, oh, just because it, you know, the ABV is lower doesn't make it authentic enough, but I'm still going to call it whiskey. You don't get to make that fucking choice. There's a reason that there are requirements by This law. is somebody who's... Con- can probably fill that empty position at Bud Light next. Yes. I, th- I think they, yes. they, they, they've got a calling there. So once again, folks, drink curious, drink what you like, know why you like it, and be comfortable enough to tell Bob and I we're wrong. That's cool. But once again... And you know something? I, w- I want to take this opportunity here. So people have been writing into us and saying that, you know, okay, we, especially getting into the bourbon bullshit, and we, we tend to... Uh, perhaps go off on a few things here and there, as we've been told. What the fuck are you talking about? But Yeah, exactly. But they say, well, why don't you guys give us a record? What can we do instead? Well, here's what you can do instead. So think about something. We were talking about peanut butter whiskey. Like I just said, what about peanut, the Reese's, uh, Reese's Pieces? Those eggs are fantastic. And I had them back to back with the M&M peanut butter eggs. Mm-hmm. The Reese's eggs are far better. Oh, yeah. The Reese's Absolutely. Pieces eggs are far better. But you have those. And then you take something that's got like an extra, you know, you get you got a really sweet. I'll take something that has a a, a, a much woodier, you know, more oaky uh, vibe, really like a old granddad one fourteen. Mm-hmm. And I'll pair the old granddad one fourteen with the peanut butter chocolate candy. That'll be beautiful. Or take something like wild turkey one hundred one, and you get that little hint of cinnamon, cinnamon and peanut butter with chocolate. But just have those things and try different things. You're gonna I, for me, I'm gonna want something that's really going to be able to cut that sweetness. So I'm gonna go for a more so at least something that's a hundred proof mm-hmm. and not something that's overly sweet. I'm not gonna go for a Tennessee whiskey. I'm gonna go for a bourbon. You know, I don't know what a, I don't think a rye would mash up well, pun intended. But <laughs> you know, well, I'll tell you what. Let's try go. some try some OGD one fourteen and your peanut butter chocolate Easter. Well, you know, beam all of beam stuff has got that nice peanutty flavor, and I was even gonna go as far as go ahead and you know take advantage of the seasons, right? So go get your Girl Scout cookie peanut butter patties and pair that with some Jim Beam products, whatever your your favorite is, right? And, uh, and you'll be much better off. I have to agree with you. Um, and, uh, you know, get, get, buy a whole bunch of peanut products, invite people over, have a party, find the favorite pairing. Um, you know, there's a lot of, lot of, uh, tasting guides out there, but, uh, I think Bob, that's, that was a truly awesome thing for you to extend that to our, to our listeners and give them that advice, um, and say no to screwball. That's right. Say no to screwball. Just think about it. What, I mean, I don't know even what it costs, but I know it's not like nine bucks you know go you know you can spend you can buy a bottle of evan williams bottled and bond 15 bucks and look at what you got when you don't want peanut butter you've got a it's decent and we're gonna put a plug i don't know what if anything our friends at uh rd bills makes with peanuts because i know they got some allergy issues they watch out for but if they ever put anything out with peanut butter in it grab it um you you won't you won't be uh won't be disappointed so and that now pops you're actually getting me so so now that it is uh girl scout cookie time folks what is your favorite girl scout cookie oh, bourbon there pairing? it goes we want to know we want to know what you like send it to podcast at bourbonandbanner.com and let us know because you know we tend to have been known from time to time to indulge in a cookie and no no wait hold on hold on i don't want anybody anybody fact checking this you have never in your life eaten a cookie. I have when there was only one in a bag. That's all I could have. Yeah, but that was l- one left. I have a cookie. Yeah, but that's like non-intentional. It's like a rare white elk. I know you never see that's it. That's right. I know. 
So, yeah, tell us what your Girl Scout cookie and bourbon pairings are, folks. Let us know. I like the Samoas. And, and if you would like you know. us to affirm you, please send unopened boxes to our attention. Uh, once again, as he said, podcast at bourbonbanter.com, and we'll tell you where to ship it. And uh, we, will, uh, we'll, we will eat them, taste something with it, and record a little something special for you. Uh, well, that's our, that's our gift for you in exchange for some free cookies. All right. Now, now we're going to turn the heat up a little bit. If you've listened to the podcast, you know that I have a personal simmering issue with spirit competitions. I find them to be nothing more than money grabs, uh, where people get participation trophies, even if their whiskeys aren't the best of the best. Now, I do admit that the brands benefit because if they win or get high law, it gives them consumer trust and gets people to buy their products. But I think they're just really a, an unnecessary evil that exists in the industry. You've heard me talk further more about the launch of the Ascot Awards um, during the pandemic from fred minnick and uh once again nothing against fred personally but i just don't like spirit competition so he launched one so i have an issue with the spirit competition but he really got me riled up because this year he's decided that um he's opening up people giving them the option to submit private barrel selections Now, we are only at the end of February, and I think this is going to be right at the top of my list for bullshit story of the year. So let me just repeat that. You can now pay the ASCOT Awards $300 entry fee to submit a bottle of whiskey that you private selected from a distillery that you had no involvement in making, And at some extent, you had no involvement in ultimately choosing because you're only choosing from the choices that they give you. Now, for that $300, you have to send in two full bottles. So let's say at the low end, it's $50 a bottle. So it's another $100 of your money plus shipping. So now you're in $450, let's call it, to submit this so that the tasting panel can make you feel good about the barrel pick that you selected or in the case that you only get a participation award make you feel kind of bad all right so just step back for a second bob how many of our last four rows of single barrel picks could you have purchased with 450 dollars carry to one divide by 12 i'll give you the answer seven or eight yeah roughly seven not accounting for tax Okay. Um, and by the way, in our single bar club, you, you pay to be part of the club, but you actually get your bottles at a discount. So that's how we get the seven. Um, we don't mark that shit up. Seven bottles of delicious, super intense, old, complex, liquid gold, four roses, private selections, or a pat on the back from the Ascot Awards. Bob? Tough decision. What would you choose? You really asking me that question? I'm really asking that question, my friend, because I need to take you, a drink. You, you know, uh, oh, I just yeah, I'm I'm trying to breathe deeply here. Oh wait, let me let me let me breathe let deeply. me make the decision harder. And by by the way, Bob, if you win an award for another two hundred and fifteen dollars, you can get a trophy. You can get the actual award itself, other than a certificate. So now, the fuck out of here. Now we're in at six seventy five plus shipping. For what? For what? You've already bought the barrel. You have it. This is just a look at me award from the Ascot Awards. Mm-hmm. You a look at me from a from an article of clothing around a guy's fucking neck. Who cares? Who fucking cares? So I'm I'm waiting. Here's what I'm waiting for. I'm waiting for the next barbecue competition to start where I can go buy my barbecue from a barbecue place and submit it. Right. Um, I think that'd be cool. Right. Maybe and get, you know, top barbecue chef award. Um, but, I, but don't worry, Bob, once again, in your theme of 
people wanting alternatives saying, okay, so you guys are tearing up the ASCAT awards and whatever. So, so what's the alternative? Well, I've got an answer for you. Since Bob and I are really big men of the people. And when we say big, we're big. Um, we we do have an alternative here. Um, so if you really need the validation from a panel of experts to tell you that the whiskey you picked from the cream of the crop barrels that the distillery who made the whiskey gave to you to choose from, okay, save your money, send a bottle to Bob and I, just one bottle, doesn't have to be two, see, we're already saving you money. There's no entry free, entry fee. We will drink it on the podcast and we'll mention your name and we will thank you and we'll tell you what we think of the whiskey. Okay. Now, if you need a little bit more affirmation, include payment of a hundred dollars. Okay. And we'll heap on endless praise. Uh, maybe drop your name in social media and talk about how big of a fucking rock star you are. So think about this 450 versus zero or a hundred dollars. Everybody wins and you've saved a shit ton of money and you know, you mentioned our podcast. I mean, I think this is a much better deal. And quite frankly, I, I hope somebody takes us up on it. I'm kind of speechless for once, Pops. I really don't I really don't have uh I don't know where to go with this. There's eleven fucking categories. Just 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 f- in for single the f- barrel pick. Just for single for whiskey club barrel 11? pick. Eleven? Eleven categories. Like straight what are they? Bourbon, high proof straight bourbon. High proof bourbon barrel finish. So just let's stop at those three: straight bourbon and high proof straight bourbon. So what's the cutoff for high proof single barrels? Yeah, what is that under and over a hundred? You you've only got a handful of barrel picks under a hundred proof. You're gonna get what? Who's got the best Woodford? <laughs> you know, store pick. I <laughs> mean, they've really, all got the, the same two hundred flavors. Exactly. Then you go to craft bourbon, not sourced. Rye, high proof rye, high proof rye barrel finish, craft rye, malt. How many fucking private pick malt whiskeys are out there? Craft malt. Go oh, craft. And other. But in the other, it says in parentheses, create a category. So should we collect money for it? Should we create a category and send it to Fred? <laughs> and. and I'm going to stop there before, I, you know, I've got some ideas, I, I, I th- but I, you know what, you know what he's going to launch next year. I'm calling it right now because then I'm going to call in for next year. He's going to have a category for submit your infinity barrel bottle, right? I'm actually surprised that wasn't first. The, you know where this is going to go. You know, you watch these history things and eventually he's going to have the, the, the at home rectifier category. <laughs> So, can you doctor a whiskey enough to win the competition? Oh, that'll be safe. But you know what the the saddest thing about this all, you know, so you're you're getting you're doing all this for stuff that most likely anybody who's going through the 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 trouble and the cost of doing this, you're not going to be able to buy the bottles anyway. They're going to be sold out for whatever the the whoever the group is doing this, right? You know. Uh, so what it's, what is the fucking point? This is literally a look at me. So here's the thing. So let's just say, Bob, here's what you do, right? Here's, here's the tip. So if you got money, people, this is what you do. You secure a really good barrel pick. So like a four rows or something like that. You buy the whole barrel yourself. You submit it to Fred's competition. You spend your money. He gives you a big award for it, Right. And then you talk about how people are like, oh, I want to get a barrel. I want to get a bottle of that. You go in all the secondary groups and you slowly sell off the couple hundred bottles that you have for like a couple hundred bucks a piece and you clean up because what this is doing, Bob, you've you hit the nail on the head is by adding this barrel pick category. And I don't think he's intended it this way, but he's basically spurring on the secondary market right it's bad enough that you add this award value to a product that is retail available right through legal channels but now you're spurring on people trying to get hold of these these picks 
and you're adding additional validation to it, which is even worse. I think it's bad enough that someone would spend the money, but if you're, if you are a flipper and you're looking at this, this is genius, right? Then you get one of the biggest names in bourbon that helps sell stuff to endorse your product that you're now selling for huge markups. It's everything that I hate about that aspect of the business. Oh my God. And remember folks, when I talk measured like this, it means I'm really fucking act off. Here's the flip side for you. Well, what do you guys, how do we know if a, if a barrel pick, a private pick is good enough for us to buy a bottle of it? You know, something, ask somebody for a taste. Usually most of the places that are doing this, mm-hmm. you know, most of the stores, they have a tasting bar. You can get a taste of something if it's still there. Or you talk to the people at the store. You find the people who you've got a palate, you know that you're going to enjoy what they're picking. You get to learn and get to know these folks. And most of the time, you're not, most of the time, this private stuff, if it's something that you like a regular release of, you're going to like the, the private pick. You know, for, for the folks who are new listening to us, like, well, I don't know where to go. There's all these awards, and it makes it easier for me to choose. You don't have to look at awards. Awards are bought and paid for, as Pops has just stated. But you can look at somebody that you trust. It doesn't even have to be bourbon and banter. You can look at a publication that you trust and read, reviews and tasting notes, and you can start to see, do a little bit of research before you go out to buy these things. Yes. You know, and, and you can get the information without having to look at somebody who's won an award that they had to pay anywhere from four to $700 for. Well, I, I would like to believe that this is purely, he saw an opportunity, you know, that he had an idea and said, let's do this. But I suspect there were a bunch of people that asked him to do this and said, hey, we got these things. And I've always had the problem. I've had the problem where, you know, it's bad enough distillers will can pick a cherry, pick a bottle from a single barrel and send it in, right? <clears throat> and this is just opening up that cavern wide. And if it's successful, you're probably going to see other people do it as well. Um, and it's unfortunate. So once again, for me, the dangerous downstream implications of this beyond people spending money that they should invest in other places. That's a personal decision. I don't like it. I think it's stupid. But hey, you you got the money. You want to do it? Great. But the fact is now that you're going to add hype on top of hype and secondary prices, um, it's just bad. It's bad for the industry. It's bad for everybody involved. And at the end of the day, if you cannot sleep at night thinking that you did a good barrel pick, you have no business picking a barrel. If you need validation... If you need the hype, um, this is right up there with crotch shots and wrist shots and all this bullshit. Um, just say no, folks. Um, just say no. Hey, folks, thanks for joining us for the 23rd episode of the Bourbon and Banter Podcast. Bob and I really appreciate you tuning in and giving us your attention. And remember, if you have feedback on the show, likes, dislikes, things that you wish we never talk about again, or you want to send us a lovely pairing idea in a bottle, drop us a line at podcast at bourbonbanter.com and let us know what you think. And remember, you can sign up for getting into our Slack community or our single barrel club through links available in the show notes on the website. If you're listening to this through your favorite uh, podcast player, we got a lot of great stuff coming down the pipe. So make sure you tune in each and every month to hear what we've got planned. And until then folks, if you're going to drink, drink curious. Well, what's your preference? Bourbon. If you got it. Bourbon from Kentucky. I should certainly fucking hope so.